Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to thank Susana, Rodrigo, and Lee for their invitation to speak today, and to Adriana and the other panelists for sharing their um, inspiring and important ideas and research. And of course, to everyone watching the program, uh, it's an honor to be part of this conversation. On a summer day in 1974, the Artist Collective and FOCO staged the first photographic exhibition at the annual Puerto Rican Folkloric Festival in New York City's Central Park. A photograph from the occasion reveals a display of prints on the exterior of a freestanding four wall enclosure erected on a lawn. Amid the crowd of spectators, a child in a wide brim hat pauses in contemplation, eye level with the photographs, a stance echoed by another child in profile. The image testifies to the relationship between photography and community, in this case framing its youngest members as central protagonists. The Folkloric Festival was established in 1967 to celebrate the heritage and culture of the Puerto Rican diaspora in New York. A program for artistic expression was added in 1974 by the newly founded Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College to showcase, quote, art born from the Puerto Rican reality in the U.S., arising from the streets, expressing the attitudes, feelings, and history of the Puerto Rican masses, end quote. And FOCO's participation thus marked the premiere of photography in the event, asserting the medium's proficiency in reflecting the spirit of the New Yorkian experience. The belief in the medium's significance for Puerto Rican photographers and the community at large is what drove Charles Biasini Rivera, Phil Dante, and Roger Caban to establish and FOCO earlier that year. And here we have an image of the founding members, uh, including uh, George Malave and Nesta Cortijo as well. In response to the lack of representation of Puerto Rican photographers in galleries and museums, as well as professional opportunities and resources, the founding members envisioned a collaborative space to exhibit work, to create group portfolios, and develop educational and mentorship programs. In these early years, Enfoco put substantial effort into fostering the public's relationship with photography. They organized street galleries that showcased photographs on neighborhood blocks and in parks like the event in Central Park, where members also set up Polaroid studios to teach instant photography. The group created programs that catered to a range of skill levels, offering free or affordable technical workshops and seminars on subjects from camera basics to preparing photographic portfolios. After becoming incorporated in 1978, and FOCO established headquarters in a Bronx building donated by Lehman College, and the following year, launched a visual literacy workshop to teach photography to public school students in the South Bronx. In 1985, Enfoco began publishing Nueva Luz, a quarterly photographic journal that highlights emerging and mid-career Latinx and other US-based artists of color. Since the group's inception, the work of Enfoco photographers and the public engagement they fostered reflected the community-oriented photographic praxis. In addition to portfolios and exhibitions, their programs and workshops modeled a collaborative practice focused on expanded ideas of audience, viewership, pedagogy, and mentorship. In considering these efforts with specific attention to the street gallery program, I argue that Enfoco saw beyond the call for representation at the levels of both image and institution, embracing the potential of photography as a community service. To do so, I understand photography as an event or site of action rather than a technology controlled by a singular subject to produce an image. Aligned with the scholarship of Ariella Azoulay, Krista Thompson, and Colin Gunkel, among others, this expanded framework views photography as an inherently collaborative process that encompasses the social relations, interactions, and performative acts that surround the making of images, their circulation, and exhibition. A productive versus illustrative view of the medium also lends itself to studies that excavate photography's role in negotiating the terrain through which communities are imagined and articulated in the ongoing process of diaspora. Understanding representation as only a first step towards social impact, I believe in FOCO's photographic practice facilitated an environment that invited the community to engage in photographic acts that actively incorporated them into the project of New Yorican visuality. And FOCO emerged during a period of Puerto Rican political and cultural awakening in New York, known as El Nuevo Despertar. In the late 1960s and 1970s, the term New Yorican became embraced politically and culturally, co-opting its derogatory use to describe New York-born or base Puerto Ricans 
who lacked fluency in Spanish or firsthand familiarity with the island. The New Yorican movement of artists and writers that emerged foregrounded recognition, education, and professionalization in the arts as vital to achieving empowerment and visibility in the public sphere. During this time, a myriad of formal and informal New Yorican cultural organizations, including museums, artist collectives, workshops, agencies, and exhibition spaces were established. Among these were El Museo, among these were El Museo del Barrio in 1969, the printmaking collective El Taller Boricua in 1970, the Institute of Contemporary Hispanic Art in 73, and the Caribbean Cultural Center in 75, to name just a few. These Puerto Rican artists and cultural workers promoted the democratization of art and challenged the lack of representation of artists of color in mainstream art institutions. This contribution is overlooked in histories of arts activism in the period that account for the activities of groups like the Art Workers Coalition that had a vital Puerto Rican presence. Beyond the fight for inclusion and in the spirit of self-determination, Enfoco and the organizations they developed alongside met community needs by providing educational services and artistic training that opposed elite market-driven practices. The members of Enfoco were not the first to commit photography to the task of visualizing the New York Puerto Rican experience. In the 1960s, Frank Espada, Jairo Maristini, and Maximo Rafael Colon began to photograph daily life in the barrios of East New York, East Harlem, and the Lower East Side, as well as the political atmosphere defined by grassroots activism and the struggle for civil rights. In the 1970s and 1980s, however, the community of Latinx photographers expanded considerably. Elizabeth Ferrer partly attributes this growth to the medium's general flourishing at the time due to its rising status as a quote unquote serious art form and increased presence in museum collections and course offerings in university curricula. Photography exhibitions dedicated to the Puerto Rican experience proliferated throughout the decade, beginning in 1973 with Dos Mundos, Worlds of the Puerto Rican, organized by the Institute of Contemporary Hispanic Art. Biasini Rivera, Dante, and Caban were among the 12 photographers featured in the show, the success of which prompted them to establish and foco shortly thereafter. El Museo del Barrio played a large role in supporting New Rican photography throughout the two decades. The museum presented exhibitions, including La, Gal La Galleria II Photography in 1975, and FOCO's Documentation Portfolio No. 1 in 78, and La Familia in 1979. Moreover, shows such as Nine Mujeres from 1979, which featured the work of Latina photographers, and Autoretratos from 1981 were staged at F-Stop, the museum's dedicated photography gallery that opened in 1978 and held 18 photographic exhibitions between its inauguration in 1982. As a result, the New Yorican artists that found a photographic voice during the period and the institutions that supported them produced and circulated images that countered the racialized depictions of Puerto Rican life invented and perpetuated by the mainstream media and Hollywood, which associated the community with poverty, gangs, and criminality. And Foco's formation contributed to a decisive moment in the development of New Yorican photography when the stakes of both picking up the camera and being photographed changed. And FOCO's community-centered vision was cemented in their first collaborative print portfolio, the New York Puerto Rican Experience. The photographs taken between 1973 and 1974 were exhibited for the first time at El Museo del Barrio in 1978, following the portfolio's donation to the institution two years prior. For the project, Caban, Biasini, Rivera, and Dante utilized the themes of small business, education, and labor, and the resulting suite of 79 silver gelatin prints unveil and immortalize the texture of everyday life. The scenes encompass the urban and the rural, from city grocery fronts, barbershops, and high school cafeterias, to the living quarters of agricultural workers upstate. Students, bodega owners, sign painters, garment workers, and magazine editors emerge as the protagonists of this photographic story, many for the first time, especially with Puerto Rican photographers behind the lens. In the exhibition brochure, the group declared, quote, and FOCO believes it is not enough to create high level art because the involvement and experience that a community may derive is as important as the aesthetic consideration, end quote. The founders of Enfoco deemed the individual status of the artists and the aesthetic concerns motivating photographic expression as secondary to the benefits and impact the medium could have on a community level. 
and Foco's practical implementation of this belief utilized, that utilized photography as a wide reaching social practice is revealed in the street gallery program. Sometimes referred to as the floating community gallery, this portable unit brought photography directly to the people. Constructed from plywood doors, jury rigged with two by fours, the display was driven from site to site in an old VW microbus, easily assembled and disassembled. The exhibitions were frequently accompanied by an information table where interested passersby could converse with Enfoco members and learn about the activities and workshops they sponsored. The street gallery transformed the terms of spectatorship typically experienced in museums and galleries. Removed from the mausoleum or the white cube and placed into the everyday setting of the barrio, the photographs ceased to be privileged objects with value determined by aesthetic and market conditions. Displaying artwork on the streets for public consumption, however, was not unique to Enfoco. Other New Yorkian arts organizations, including the printmaking collective El Taller Boricua, also organized outdoor exhibitions and workshops. Moreover, the original idea behind El Museo del Barrio, proposed by its co-founder and early director, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, was a portable museum that could provide a practical alternative to the orthodox institution. Discussed in an article published in Art in America in 1971, Ortiz called for a museumless museum to promote accessibility using slides, tapes, film, and television to produce a multi-sensory experience. While this vision did not come to fruition as a permanent state for El Museo, the institution did launch a mobile unit in 1972 that consisted of a van that transported exhibitions, of objects, slide presentations, and film screenings to elementary schools, colleges, and community festivals throughout the city and tri-state area. In Enfoco Street Gallery, accessibility was underscored by the fact that many of the photographs were taken in the same neighborhoods in which they were exhibited. Reflecting on the impact this had on the viewing experience, Yesenia Rivera noted that the community was especially drawn to, photograph, to the photographs because for the first time, people were face to face with images that reflected their own lives and experiences, quote, as if they were seeing their own relatives, end quote. Within the alternative context of the street display, the photographs functioned as shared cultural artifacts that derive value from the community and diverse moments of individual and collective encounter. And Foco's understanding of photography's potential for building community networks is revealed in images of the street gallery that capture spectator interaction and unveil layered photographic encounters. In an unattributed photograph from 1978, a group of grinning youth pose in front of the plywood exhibit flanked by two large-scale prints. Some of the children kneel while others stand with their hands on their hips or arms resting at their sides. In this playful instant, a young boy in the middle of the cluster holds up a puppy while another flashes two peace signs and a girl in the back row has seemingly just dropped her hula hoop to pose. Most of their gazes, however, are drawn toward the bottom left corner of the composition at someone taking their picture outside of the frame. Here, photographic acts become the subject of the image, both the act of taking a photo and the performance of posing for one. The former is reinforced by the fact that the children do not stare back at the viewer slash photographer of our frame. Instead, they pose for another, which turns the scene into a more objective interest in the act of photographing itself. As both spectators of the exhibition and photographic subjects, the children enjoy the experience of both viewing and being seen. Moreover, the transformation of the group into photographic subjects occurs against the backdrop of the works on display. They pose next to a large scale print on poster board, a close up portrait of 73 year old Doña Elvira Rodriguez taken in Puerto Rico by New Rican photographer Frank Mendez in 1974. Their physical and photographic union with Mendez's image on the streets of New York bonds the children to generations past and present on the island evoking the condition of diaspora as both multi-sided and visual. This functions as a photographically framed embodiment of the translocality of the Puerto Rican diaspora, a deterritorialized identity formed outside of sovereignty and the idea of the nation state and the imagined community it continually makes and remakes. Another similar moment of community engagement with the street gallery is unveiled in a photograph by David Gonzalez, a Bronx native who joined Enfoco in 1979 after graduating from Yale and served as an educator and project coordinator. Gonzalez's image shows a street gallery set up in Roberto Clemente State Park that featured the work of photographers Phil Dante and Frank Mendez. 
The exhibition was part of the programming for Enfoco's first annual photographic festival, which celebrated the organization's one year anniversary in the Bronx and consisted of four weeks of exhibitions, workshops, seminars, and film screenings that were free and open to the public. In the photograph, two spectators pose with an oversized portrait of three women affixed to a metal fence. In the large photograph used as a backdrop, the central figure rests her hand on her hip with her elbow pointed outward, a gesture echoed by the women who stand in front of it. The pair pose for a woman in the foreground, perhaps a friend, who assumes a photographer's stance with one foot in front of the other, holding a small point and shoot camera up to her eye. A small crowd of swimmers, some with towels wrapped around their waists, takes a break from the pool in the park complex, peering onto the scene through the negative space of the fence. Gonzalez's frame captures multiple photographic encounters that reveal the desirability of being on both sides of the camera. The inclusion of the woman taking the portrait, coupled with Gonzalez's gesture of documenting the scene himself, places the act of photographing into focus. This fact is reinforced by the presence of the crowd that watches the spectacle unfold, who become subjects within both photographers' frame. In reflecting on the street gallery program, Gonzalez noted the popularity of spectators posing with photographs. This is suggested in the image by another slightly camouflaged large scale print propped against the fence that signals the availability of a second backdrop. Like in the image of the children in front of the street gallery, Gonzalez foregrounds the performative act of being photographed, what Krista Thompson has described in another context as photographic becoming in front of a community audience. In her study of Black diasporic photographic and videographic practices in the Circum Caribbean, Thompson explores how visual technologies negotiate the ways diasporas are imagined and claim the right to be seen. She argues that in addition to being a tool that produces a physical representation, the camera functions as a prop in performances of visibility. Through examples of mobile street photography studios, Thompson explores how the process of being seen and being photographed becomes its own, quote, ephemeral form of image making, end quote. Publicly posing with the display of images in Enfoco Street Gallery, spectators similarly experience the photographic through temporal performances of visibility that hold significance beyond the resulting physical image. The, gal the street gallery inspired viewers to enact the role of photographer and subject, actively incorporating them into the project of New Yorkian visuality. Ultimately, through the street exhibitions and workshops, and FOCO introduced new ways of seeing and being seen that bolstered community frame narratives and subjectivities. The group's efforts thus brought the medium's capacity to serve rather than merely represent the community into focus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarada. That was a really wonderful presentation and the archival photos you found are especially beautiful. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Abigail Lapandar Dashti, Assistant Professor of Art History and Visual Studies at the University of California, Irvine to present next. And I thank everyone for being patient with the changes to the schedule, but uh, Professor Dardashti is doing truly heroic work for art history right now. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, I hope everybody could hear me well. We can hear you, yeah, sound great. Okay, great. Um, I first wanted to thank Lee and El Museo in general so much for the invitation, for putting together the symposium, for applying for funding for it. Uh, I wanna especially thank Rodrigo and Susie for uh, all of their work in the past, since they got to El Museo, actually, not just for the collection and for exhibitions, but also for uh, researchers like myself who um, have really relied on them to for access to archives and contacts within El Bajo. So I just wanted to thank them especially. Um, I want to also thank Marcos Dimas and Elisa Larkin Nascimento for access to archives. And I'd like to dedicate uh, this talk to Hiram Maristani, who, as many of you know, um, was a great community member, photographer, activist, um, and who, thanks to Miguel Luciano, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with before he passed. Uh, today, I'm going to present an excerpt of an essay that is going to be published in American Art Journal next month. 
Uh, I've been talking about this essay for a very long time, so Rodrigo is probably wondering <laughs> whether it actually exists or not, but um, hopefully uh, it comes out uh, finally next month after several years. Uh, and I'm gonna share some brief ideas about another essay that I'm working on now. In 1981, the New York artist Jose Soto Sanchez argued for the existence of a Caribbean aesthetic from the United States in an article published by the New York-based interdisciplinary journal, Caribe. Recognizing the impact of migration, colonialism, and urban inequalities on the production of art, Soto named several artists of Latin American ancestry who, in his opinion, contributed to this aesthetic. He included Abdias do Nascimento, an Afro-Brazilian painter and activist residing in the United States from 1968 to the early 1980s, who was an active participant in New York's Caribbean American and African American art scenes. A year earlier in 1980, Caribe had dedicated an entire issue to Afro-Brazilian to Afro resistance and featured an article by Nascimento discussing anti-racist activism and its expressions in visual art. Nascimento exhibited his paintings of Afro-Brazilian deities mixed with US black power symbolism that same year at Taller Boricua, a New York and activist arts organization whose members included Soto, solidifying his place in the city's artist activist community. Informed by political debates, exhibitions, and protests in New York City, Soto Nascimento and New York and artist Marcos Dimas created art in the context of a burgeoning Afro-Latinx aesthetic of resistance from the late 1960s to the early 1980s. Rather than influencing one another or making derivative imagery, the artist created conversations and works that present the collective response to the needs of an Afro-Latinx community, establishing activist solidarity based on social affinity. The three artists, I argue, depicted African diasporic religious symbolism from Latin America to protest racism, producing a new visual language that was at once iconographically, iconographically experimental and politically potent. In positioning Nascimento in the milieu of Afro-Latinx artistic production, instead of an exclusively Brazilian context, I present his work not only through a US post-civil rights lens, but also in relation to a transnational community of Latinx artists interested in similar issues, such as anti-racism, the multiplicity of identity, redefining citizenship and nationhood, and providing access to art exhibitions and education for working class Afro-Brazilian, African-American, Afro-Latinx, and Latinx communities. I insist that Nascimento offers a major contribution to the artistic production of Latin American descendant artists in the United States and, by extension, allows us to reframe debilitatingly limited categories, which Adriana talked about at length uh, earlier today. Dima, Soto, and Nascimento had similar experiences with Latin American racism and identity discourses that privilege whiteness, commonly associated with, uh, associating it with wealth, success, and beauty, while simultaneously affirming the absence of racism. Their art subverted racist perceptions of national identity and belonging in the Americas while also inscribing Afro-Latinx into the city's urban landscape to counter racial and social inequalities. They incorporated African diasporic religious symbolism into their work to protest religious intolerance and the widespread censorship and erasures of African diasporic heritage in the Americas. Their production is deeply intertwined with the histories of El Museo del Bajo, Taller Boricua, and the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute, organizations that emerged in the 60s and 70s and provided space and place for Latinx artists to thrive and manifest their activism. These spaces emphasized, I believe, that migratory experiences from Latin America to the United States, whether temporary or permanent, are integral to the production of Afro-Latinx art and US identity and cultural production. By emphasizing the fluidity and the multiplicity of the artist's experiences and artistic production, I propose a definition of Afro-Latinx marked by artists' shared experiences and ideas grounded in political resistance and African diasporic religious symbolism. Nascimento arrived in New York in late 1968 before moving on to a fellowship at Wesleyan and subsequently, subsequently a tenured position at University of Buffalo, which he maintained until the mid 1980s when he returned to Brazil permanently. At Wesleyan, 
After experiencing Latinx and African-American activism in New York City, he focused on the flag as a, as a failed representation of nationhood and citizenship for people of African descent globally. In Shango Sobre, or Shango Takes Over, he depicted the double axe, a symbol of the Candomblé deity of thunder and justice. Shango's axe is painted in black and covers the length of the flag, which includes the stripes, but only four stars that float around the composition. Organized vertically, the Orisha symbol becomes a metaphor for the Afro-Brazilian body dominating the flag. By monumentalizing a deity onto the US flag and flipping it vertically, Nascimento challenged Brazil's whitening of its history and identity, as well as US involvement in this discourse and its support of the 1964 military coup in his country. Con continuing with the, his imagery about Shango, Nascimento, Nascimento included a visual essay about the deity in the catalog accompanying his Taller Boricua exhibition in 1980. And this exhibition was actually in the Hersher building where El Museo is today and Marcos Dimas installed it. The layout begins with a Yoruba scepter to Shango, followed by undated figurative depictions of the Catholic Santa Barbara, which is Shango's counterpart in Afro-Brazilian religions. Finally, Nascimento includes his own painting of an abstract representation of the Orisha. He paints the inverted triangles of Shango's double axe in the upper part of the painting. The handle of the double axe becomes a complex arrangement of ge geometric shapes. The octagon at the top echoes the black power salute and could embody two conjoined fists that represent diasporic solidarity. Through his arrangement of images from different sources, Nascimento argued for the multiple and transnational nature of African diasporic deities, um, as well as definitions of diasporic identity that went beyond national delineations. It is not a coincidence that Nascimento's exhibition was organized jointly by Tayer Boricua and the Caribbean Cultural Center. In order to house their activism and art practices, just one moment, I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, in order to house their activism and art practices, New Yorkian artists established community-based galleries such as El Museo and Taller Boricua in 1969. Taller Boricua affiliated artists Soto and Dimas made sculptures in the streets of East Harlem, home to one of the city's largest communities of Puerto Rican uh, migrants and organized plein air exhibitions to make visual arts available to their underserved communities. And this is, this is um, a project, my next article project, um, which in which I would like to analyze the sculptures in these pictures, um, which deeply links to uh, Serra's presentation that we just heard. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more um, about her work. And these images are all from Marcos Dimas's a uh, private archive. In line with Nascimento, Soto's combined interest in Santeria and Taino imagery is apparent in El Matrimonio de Atabe y Shango, which was exhibited at a museo in 1979. He depicts the Taino de deity Atabe, responsible for fertility and moving bodies of water, tied to Shango by a wavy line. Seated in her customary frock pose, Atabe's face resembles the one of the Simi, a sculpture that shares a name with the expression articulating an all-encompassing Taino spirituality and political power. Soto calls on Taino petroglyphs, such as those as the, at the Centro Ceremonial Indígena de Caguana, which include a relic of Atabe. Considered one of the most ar important archaeological sites from the pre-Columbian period. Caguana 
was a stop on the research visits of artists like Soto and Dimas, who traveled throughout Puerto Rico exploring Taino relics in the 1960s and 70s. And here I'm showing a um, picture of also from Marcos's um, Marcos's archive. Uh, I'm sorry, I have my baby with me and she decided not to be happy <laughs> at the right moment. Um, uh, so this is uh, an image from Marcos's uh, archive as well, which in which you could see Marcos and a, a friend who has not been identified uh, at Caguana and Soto also um, uh, researched extensively uh, at Caguana. Instead of using symmetrically curved and straight lines, Soto draws twirling shapes and zigzags, complicating the thick rounded contours of the stylized figures at Caguana. His representations of the imperfect body relate to derogatory perceptions about Taino uh, uh, art and the indigenous person. Soto wrote that he sought to examine, quote, what has survived of Africa in Puerto, in Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands, and what these objects, artifacts, and sculptured pieces tell us about our ancestors, end quote. His drawings propose a new vision for US art of the 1970s, one that centralizes Puerto Rican indigenous culture and transnational migration. Soto related his depictions to New York City's working class urban landscape. He drew his thick twirling lines at a time when graffiti art or writing on the wall proliferated in the city's urban spaces. Young Puerto Rican men were especially active in graffiti production. Soto and Dimas became acutely aware of both graffiti's aesthetics as well as its subvertive, subversive message, which reclaimed the city's public spaces amid pervasive inequality and discrimination. In his work, Soto employs thick contours, fragmented lines, and long routed tubular shapes to form his figures and their entourage, emulating the outlines of tags throughout the subway system. The lines position the figures metaphorically within New York City's urban fabric, as if they were sketches for graffiti on a subway car. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, these are uh, negatives that I scanned from Marcos's archive. So these are photographs he took, and he actually has a really wonderful and very large um, uh, arch, as Rodrigo knows, of archive uh, of negatives um, that have not been studied. Vanity table uh, is. Um, uh, which I'm showing on the right here, and I'll show uh, another image that's a little bit less blurry, um, was made in line in, with Soto's drawings. Uh, and uh, the combination of Taino and African diasporic religious symbolism that evokes urban inequality. These ideas dominated Dimas's exhibition, The Voyager at El Museo in 1981. Composed, composed of coalesced discarded material found on East Harlem Street, the assemblages in the Voyager included the furniture of a surreal bedroom. And these works that I'm going to show from the Voyager are mostly lost. And Museo, I think, retains one work that I'm actually not going to talk about. But Marcos told me that uh, most of these objects were just uh, uh, unfortunately uh, lost and, and discarded um, following the exhibition. Vanity table fe featured found objects of yellow foam, wood, nails, a mirror, a veiny rock sourced from East Harlem or the Bronx, and a table that, he, that Dimas carved with neoclassical details. Dimas manufactured a wooden triangular base with rough foam lining the top and long nails hammered into the interior. In the exhibition, he positioned a collapsed chair in front of the table. This uncomfortable and unwelcoming arrangement undermined the vanity's purpose to leisurely gaze at oneself in the mirror. 
Here, the experience of looking in the mirror is interrupted by sharp nails resonating perhaps with the difficult process of forming one's identity amid per pervasive racism. Then a table conjures African sculptures that Dimas studied at the American Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as well as in books. The mirror and nails recall the ones lining the surface of the Congo Niki Sinakongi, a power figure that houses mystical forces in its crevice belly, which contains a mirror to recall water and the ancestral realm. Dimas told me that he thought about the concave belly of the Nikisi and its mirror while he made Vanity Table. Vanity Table gestures to the trauma of poverty, displacement, and discrimination. In the catalog for his El Museo exhibition, Dimas wrote that he created the works in the late 1960s and described them as described the, the works uh, as a whole, so the of as a quote, psycho abstract work influenced by the times, soft on the outside, menacing on the inside, a turbulent character beneath a warm exterior, end quote. Grounding his practice at Taller Burico and El Museo, havens for artists from working class backgrounds, Dimas in his vanity table expresses a position of alterity. The foam is tattered and fragmented. Despite its quote unquote soft nature, it appears rough and unfinished. Along with the nails on the inside, the sharp angle and the rigidity of the straight wooden frame reference the grit of Dimas's urban life, further emphasizing an inhospitable living space. In the center of Enmusu's gallery, Dimas placed bed, the platform um, of which is bare, but for a large ax with barbed wire plunged into uh, two pillows. Seen from the end of the bed, the sculpture resembles a ship with the ax serving as the central mast and resonates with the history of the Middle Passage. Dimas represents urban poverty as a consequence of slavery and persistent racism. The top of the protruding ax is wrapped with barbed wire that extends beyond it, creating a hostile surrounding that subverts the expectation of comfort and intimacy. Echoing imprisonment and restricted spaces and movement through the barbed wire, Dimas's work gestures to the lack of social mobility for working class New Yorkians within the art worlds and everyday life. On the left of the bed against the wall, Dimas positioned mirror composed of two triangles that meet at the tip. It recalls Shango's double ax flipped at a 90 degree angle. Looking into the mirror, viewers would see a partial reflection of themselves as well as the bed behind them. And to the right, a peripheral view of vanity table. Because of the shape of the mirror, viewers would look either above or below them. At, at their, as their eye level would be at the center of Shango's double ax, blocking their reflection. Dimas created a disruption vision of the self, resonating with the fissures both of his own experience and in identity formation and experience of New Yorkans. Ultimately, his installation showed that the erasure of African heritage is directly linked to urban poverty, as there are both consequences of racism and discrimination, as well as their visual imagery and personal experiences. The Afro-Latinx art of Soto, Dimas, and Nascimento is relational, and I emphasize here this, the word relational, informed by migration, as well as social, racial, and political experiences that exceed national categories and are difficult to pinpoint and define. And again, I think this is something Adriana very eloquently um, discussed uh, earlier today. Ultimately, there are endless layers to the consciousnesses and identity formations illustrated in Afro-Latinx art. In addition to studying the art of settled Latinx community in the United States, we must also include circular migrants like Nascimento. Thinking of Nascimento in relation to Soto and Dimas unsettles notions that attach artistic production to place-based belonging and ethno-national concepts of identity. In the context of El Museo Taller Boricua and the Caribbean Cultural Center, Afro-Latinx art becomes an articulation of anti-racism and Afro-Latin Americanness as expressed through a post-civil rights US lens, rather than simply an ethnic categorization in our history. Um, and again, I'm so grateful for having been able to share my work today. And I also want to add that um, in thinking, in making the presentation, in writing the paper, um, 
I believe that the works that are lost are still part of El Museo's collection since we're talking today about La Colección uh, and these, the, obviously the, the history and the archive that Susana and Rodrigo are, are publicizing um, to me are part of the collection, obviously the history of the institution. Uh, so showing these works to me is talking about La Colección. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dagdashi, for a really wonderful presentation um, and a close and fascinating look at some really amazing artworks. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to um, Melissa, Melissa M. Ramos Borges, uh, art professor of art history and theory at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, and Rio Pedras. Good afternoon. Um, I am delighted to be a part of this symposium and I am grateful to the Museo del Barrio team for inviting me to participate. I also want to thank those who took time to tune in via Zoom or Facebook Live. I was encouraged to present Puerto Rican avant-garde and their afterlife, which is the basis of my dissertation, Omisión o Censura, Una revisión de la vanguardia artística en Puerto Rico, 1960-1970, presented at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in January 2020. In it, I argued that art history in Puerto Rico, produced from mid-1980s onward, consciously omitted the work of avant-garde artists of the 1960s and 1970s. This conference is loosely based on on my dissertation, and in the time allotted, I will try to correct misconceptions about avant-garde art produced on the island and remark on and make remarks on avant-garde struggles with the Puerto Rican art historical canon. Before delving into the issue at hand, I think it's best to define the term avant-garde, which was first employed by critics in local newspapers in the mid-1960s. Junk art, neo dada, geometric abstraction minimalism, hard edge, shaped canvases, conceptualism, pop, happenings, and installations were all encompassed under the term avant-garde art. I want to take a, a moment also to acknowledge Ernesto Jaime Ruiz de la Mata, William Overbay, Antonio Molina, Jesse Fernandez, Felix Bonilla Norat, Mirna Rodriguez, among other critics working at, at printed media outlets uh, for being the first chronicles of avant-garde art on the island. And above all, because they unwillingly, or unknowingly, excuse me, were the ones who safeguarded its, its existence. Okay. Printed media was the bulk of my references since the few Puerto Rican art publications that exist scarcely mention avant-garde art or its artists. After reviewing 20 years of island-wide circulation newspapers like El Mundo, the San Juan Star, and El Imparcial, as well as magazines such as La Revista de Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, the San Juan Review, and the Univ and Universidad de Puerto Rico's Mayagüez Campus, the Art Review, I realized that what I had initially thought to have been a small phenomenon at the margins of the local art scene turned out to be something more complex and substantial, an ample network of connections, interconnections, exhibitions, and collaborations, which augmented the scope of the local avant-garde. Nonetheless, the hundreds of documents on the Puerto Rican avant-garde that I managed to collect from local archives have been left out of the quote-unquote official art history of the island. The exclusion that avant-garde endured in its afterlife in local art historiography can be character, characterized as both censorship and omission. It could be the repercussion, excuse me, this word always uh, is difficult, could be the repercussions of the generación del 50s, privileging figurative style, especially social realism, 
due to its ideological connotations and reaffirmation of a Puerto Rican identity, while openly rejecting avant-garde styles as a pro-independence strategy. The rejection of new styles was contrived as a myth of the artista comprometido, one of the pillars of Puerto Rican art canon, of the, of the Puerto Rican art canon with Francisco Oyer at its inception. As the artist biographer Osiris Delgado stated, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna quote in Spanish. Um, es bien sabido que el viejo maestro le da la espalda al impresionismo que ha ayudado a fomentar en la, en la periferia de París por urgencia de orden humano. El grito de libertad que reclama su conciencia de hombre frente a la opresión ignominiosa que atenta contra la condición humana a que percibe el artista en el Puerto Rico de entonces hace que su arte se asiente sobre la tónica de, pro, de problema social. Tuvo que regresar a Puerto Rico por imperativo de su arraigo patriótico sentimental y sus ideas libertarias, porque de eso es que se trata. End quote. Therefore, if the art canon of, of the Puerto Rican art school was being defined as dealing with Puerto Rican issues through figurative art, it is of no surprise that avant-garde conjured polemics of what was, in fact, the Puerto Rican identity. In an interview by artist turned art critic Ernesto Jaime Ruiz de la Mata to vanguard artists Carlos Irizarri and Domingo Lopez de Victoria confirmed just that when they answered the question about the public's reaction to their work, I quote, we were highly criticized though by the general public and some artists for doing art that was not Puerto Rican, end quote, stated Irizarri. Lopez, uh, Lopez de Victoria added, quote, we are being labeled non-Puerto Ricans because of our non-figurative art, shaped canvases, hard edge style painting and constructions, end quote. There is no doubt that the colonial status of the island permeates in all matters of Puerto Rican society but it is a bit preposterous to assume that working within a certain aesthetic language makes you less or more Puerto Rican. This statement also, some, uh, this uh, idea also raises some flags. Both Irizarri and Lopez de Victoria were born in Puerto Rico, but raised in New York City. When they returned to the island in mid 1960s, their experience as, as diaspora invaded their quote unquote Puerto Ricanidad. It, is, it was therefore insinuated, insinuated that the only Puerto Rican experience was that of those living on the archipelago and of those that produce artworks pointing out its social problems. Uh, Generación del 50's ideological stance on art would later be refined and articulated by Argentinian art critic Marta Trava, who lived and worked in Puerto Rico from 1969 to 1971. During her stay, she produced writings and conferences that laid the groundwork for her Teoría de la Resistencia, a reflection about modern art, about modern art of all the Latin America, of, of all Latin America, excuse me. It consisted in, in not only, it consisted not only of resisting the onslaught of the avant-garde and United States culture, both affirming a social, economic, and political difference that manifests as aesthetically. Trava's controversial 1971 Propuesta Polémica sobre Arte Puerto Riqueño became the theoretical framework that constructed a myopic discourse that would, that would narrate the official art history of Puerto Rico, since many of its authors and curators were in fact Trava's disciples at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras Campus. Trava's text was not the only publication in the 1970s about Puerto Rican art, but it was the only one to condemn the work of avant-garde artists, calling them innocuous games. Books like Pintores eh, Contemporaneos Puerto Ricanos, Peter Block's Painting and Sculpture of the Puerto Ricans, two encyclopedias, especially Tomo Ocho of the Gran Enciclopedia de Puerto Rico, discussed avant-garde art, avant-garde avant-garde artists. Moreover, comprehensive exhibitions such as Herencia Artística de Puerto Rico, 1973, 
participation in international biennials and the annual Muestra Nacional organized by the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña included avant-garde artists and their works. Yet, art history in Puerto Rico has been reduced to an equation of the issue of identity centered on hegemonic and homogenizing cultural values since the 80s. On rare occasions, articles, books, and curatorial, es and curatorial essays mention avant-garde artists. Yet, authors focus on discussing figurative and social content artworks, only referencing their avant-garde works as footnotes in the artist's career. The pinnacle of this practice was the book, okay, sorry, yes, was the textbook Puerto Rico Arte e Identidad edited by the Hermandad de Artistas Gráficos de Puerto Rico. The book is a collection of essays by various authors that try to trace artistic production in India in Puerto Rico from the time of the Spanish occupation to the mid 1990s. Scholars and essayists favored artists working on figurative styles and omitted those who did not fit in with the thesis put forth by the editors. This is precisely what Miriam Basilio pointed, pointed out in her essay included in the none of the above exhibition catalog. And I quote, in the field of art history, an equation is often made between Puerto Rican art and issues of identity, assuming that this should be the primary, if not the defining act of art produced by Puerto Rican artists, end quote. Um, I would like to add to Basilio's statement that avant-garde art therefore was considered as an art, as an act of national alienation or national dismissal. Consequently, it comes at, as no surprise that in the 19, that the 1960s and 1970s avant-garde art afterlife was confronted with deliberate omission. This is demonstrated by the fact that even though important publications of the 70s and numerous archival materials are a testimony of its existence. During the 1980s, curators and art historians faced avant-garde out. Moreover, in the classic case of out of sight, out of mind, the limited exhibition of the works preserved and conserved and preserved in public, in, in public collections in Puerto Rico, such as the Ateneo Puerto Riqueño, Universidad de Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and Rio Piedras Campuses, as well as the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, contributes to the censorship of avant-garde art, resulting in a narrative that asserts art as a tool for the affirmation of a Puerto Rican identity. Comprehensive historiographic, historiographic or compendium exhibitions about Puerto Rican art are an extension of the discourse put forth in the in Arte e Identidad, privileging once again figurative paintings, reinforcing the notion of Puerto Rican art as one of resistance, and revealing a clear and conscious omission of avant-garde art. The new millennium brought forth a resurgence of avant-garde artists of the 60s and 70s, and 60s and 70s partly through Deborah Collins' work at the Museo del Barrio, organizing exhibition as the before mentioned, none of the above, Arte no es igual a vida, and the 2010 re retrospective exhibition of pioneer avant-garde artist, Rafael Ferrer. Collins' publications and exhibitions are critical commentaries on isolated or individual art Puerto Rican vanguard artists in relation to Latin America, to the Latin America or United States art scene, or with knowing dialogue with the Museo del Barrio's collection. On my end, the research I undertook culminated in the first comprehensive study of the avant-garde in Puerto Rico, mapping out the art scene, identifying the artists, the critics, the institutions, the galleries, and discussing their controversies, their works inside it. By curating the first retrospective museum exhibition of avant-garde feminist our, uh, artist Susie Ferrer, which we see on screen, I further challenged the antiquated paternalistic and patriarchal discourses which have omitted avant-garde women among other marginalized groups from the Puerto Rican art history canon. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to uh, you, Melissa, for that really wonderful tracing of some really important artists and exhibitions, and to all of our panelists 